In this video, we're going to talk about CPU scheduling. Whoop. Butterfingers today. So, maximum CPU utilization is obtained by multiprogramming or multiprocessing, multithreading, all those things. We have CPU uh, and I.O. bus cycles. Process execution consists of a cycle of CPU execution and an I.O. wait. The CPU burst is followed by an I.O. burst often, or the, and the CPU burst distribution is of the main concern. All right, so here, we, for example, we have a CPU burst, and then we're going to wait on the I.O., going to do another CPU, an I.O. burst, and so forth. And this is a histogram of averages of CPU burst times. Notice that the frequency is rather low. So there's multiple schedulers involved. The short-term scheduler selects from among the processes in the ready queue and allocates the CPU to one of them. The queue can be ordered in various ways, and that's a whole thing in of itself. CPU scheduling decisions may take place when a process switches from running to wait state, running to ready, uh, waiting to ready, or it terminates. Scheduling under 1 and 4 is non-preemptive. Um, all other scheduling is preemptive. Non-preemptive means um, it is it can't be interrupted. The other two can. Um, in preemptive cases, you have to consider access to shared data, uh, preemption while in kernel mode, and or interrupts occurring during crucial OS activities. Um, the dispatcher module gives control of the CPU to the process selected by the short term schedule. This involves switching the context, switching back to user mode if you're not in it, jumping to the proper location in the user program to restart that program and uh, it has to deal with also dispatch latency it's the time it takes for the dispatcher to stop one process and start running another which is why you don't want to get too many swapping in and out of processes or you will lose a considerable portion of your power to swapping some criteria used in scheduling is CPU utilization we want to keep the CPU as busy as we can Throughput is the number of processes that complete their execution per unit time. Turnaround time is the amount of time to execute a particular process. Waiting time is the amount of time a process has been waiting in the ready queue. Response time is the amount of time it takes from when a request was submitted until the first response is produced, not output, uh, in a time sharing environment, for example. So, scheduling algorithm optimization criteria, max CPU utilization, max throughput, min turnaround time, minimum waiting time, and minimum response times. So our first algorithm we're going to talk about is first come, first serve scheduling, um, FCFS. Suppose the process arrive in the order P1, P2, and P3. The Gantt chart for the schedule is P1 here uh, for 24 seconds, P2 uh, we'll start at 24 and go for 3 seconds, and P3 is 30 seconds. The waiting time for each, if for P1 is 0, the for P2 it's 24, and for P3 it's 27. So the average waiting time is 0 plus 24 plus 27 divided by 3 is 17 seconds, or 17 milliseconds. Suppose that the prophecies arrive in a different order, P2, P3, P1. Now it looks like this, where P2 runs first for three seconds, P3 for six for three seconds, and then the majority, the rest of the time for P1. The waiting time for P1 is now six. P2 is zero and P3 is three. Now, interesting time here is the average waiting time for start is six plus zero plus three is three divided by three is three. Much better than the previous case. Um, the convoy effect is a short process behind a long process. Consider one CPU bound and many IO bound processes and you'll see the situation. Then there's the shortest job first scheduling. 
associate with each process the length of its next CPU burst, using these lengths to schedule the process with the shortest time. Single job, uh, shortest job first is optimal. It gives minimum average waiting time for a given set of processes. However, the difficulty is knowing the length of the next CPU request. You could ask the user, but uh, that's not going to work all that well. So here, we would say um, um, P4 would go first, P1 would go second, um, and P3 would go next, and finally P2. So the average waiting time is 3 plus uh, 3 plus 16, oh, it's doing it, uh, plus 9 plus 0 equals 7. How do we determine the length of the next CPU burst? We can only estimate the length. It should be similar to the previous one. We then prick the process with the shortest, shortest predicted next CPU burst. It can be done by using the length of the previous CPU burst using exponential averaging, where Tn is the average length of the nth CPU burst, uh, tau sub n plus 1 equals the predicted value, alpha and an alpha of less between 0 and 1. And so we can define tau sub n, equal n equals 1 equal to alpha times tau of n plus uh, 1 minus alpha times t of n. It's commonly set to 1 half. And the preemptive version is called the shortest remaining time first. And here's some prediction example and how close we actually come. Seems to be relatively close. Um, and basically this is a review of the math basically we don't count recent history and we only count the actual CPU bursts now we have the concepts of varying arrival time and preemption to the analysis so here we've got p1 arriving at time 0 p2 arriving at time 1 p3 at uh, arriving at time 2 and p4 arriving at time 3 and then we calculate user actual burn times, a uh, burst times. So P1 has a a burst time 10 minus the <clears throat> when we say preemptive, it means that based on some time slice, we can switch between processes. So the average rating time for P1 would be 10 minus 1. And then for P2, we'd get 1 minus 1. And for P3, we would get 17, which is our starting time, minus 2, plus 5 minus 3 divided by 4 to give us an average waiting time of 6.5 milliseconds. Now, priority scheduling can be done with a priority number associated with each process. The CPU is allocated to the process with the highest priority. Usually, the smallest integer is the highest priority. Uh, it can be handled both preemptively and non-preemptively. Shortest job first is priority scheduling, where priority is the inverse of predicted next CPU burst. However, there's a problem, starvation. Low-priority processes may never execute in a preemptive environment. Uh, the solution is aging. As time progresses, increase the priority of the process, so even a low-scheduled one will eventually get dealt with. So in priority scheduling, we've got um, P2, P5, P1, P3, and P4. Um, here you could, you could end up with lower priority processes uh, like P2 kind of hanging out forever um, or P5 uh, but as we go through we will increase the priority of the one so that way they don't get stuck forever each pro round now let's talk about round robin each process gets a small unit of CPU time uh, a quantum usually 10 to 100 milliseconds after this time has elapsed, the process is preempted and added to the end of the ready queue. If there are n processes in the ready queue and the time quantum is Q, then each process gets one nth of the CPU time in chunks of at most Q times units at once. 
So no process mates more than n minus 1 times q time slots. The timer interrupts every quantum to schedule the next process. Um, performance. If q is large, uh, it comes down to FIFO. If it's small, um, then q must be large with respect to the context switch. Otherwise, the overhead is too, time, too, too high. So basically, if the quantum is not as long or is short compared to the context switch, it's going to be very expensive to use one on Robin. Um, and round robin with time equals four. We'll see if P1 goes for four seconds, P2 goes for four, P3 goes for four, we're back to P1, and the other two are already done, so then we'll just continue forward. Um, typically, this is a higher uh, average turnaround time than the shortest job first, but better response. Q should be large compared to context switch times, and it's usually uh, 10 milliseconds to uh, uh, 100 milliseconds with context switch time being less than 10 uh, is it micro or nanoseconds. So here we've got process time equals 10. Uh, with the various quantums, you can see in uh, how they relate to the time switch. Turnaround time does vary greatly with the with the um, time quantum. So ideally, we'd want our bursts to be shorter than the quantum, so they don't have to be broken up. Um, you can also use multi-level queues. A ready queue is partitioned into separate queues. Foreground processes, background. The process is permanently in a given queue. Each queue would have its own scheduling algorithm. The foreground could be uh, round robin, the background could be first come first serve. Scheduling must be done between the queues. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Fixed uh, priority scheduling, i.e. serve all from the foreground then from the background, uh, introduces the possibility of, st of starvation. With time slicing, each queue gets a certain amount of CPU time which it can schedule amongst its processes. 80% to foreground in round robin and 20% to background in first come first curve for example so here's an example of a, the various different types of processes in their queues and that and how they can be organized there's also a multi-level feedback queue approach a process can move between the various queues and aging can be implemented this way um, a process can move between the various queues uh, multi-level feedback queue scheduler is defined by the following parameters the number of queues so the scheduling algorithms for each queue, the method used to determine when to upgrade a process, uh, when to demote a process, and which queue a process will enter when that process needs service. Okay, so here's an example, three queues. Uh, round robin with a quantum time of 8 milliseconds, Q1 has a round robin of 16, and Q2 has first come first serve. A new job enters Q0, which is served first come first serve. When it gains CPU, the job receives 8 milliseconds. If it does not finish in 8 milliseconds, the job is moved to Q1. At Q1, the job is again serviced full first come first serve and receives 16 additional milliseconds. If it doesn't complete, it's preempted and moved to Q2. So, thread scheduling, how does that work in relation to process scheduling? We make a distinction between user level and kernel level threads. When threads are supported, threads are scheduled, not processes. Many to one and many to many models, thread library schedules use user level threads uh, to run on lightweight processes. It's known as process contention scope, since scheduling competition is within the process now. It's typically done via priority set by a programmer. Kernel threads is, are scheduled on their own available CPU and that can cause system contention scope, competition among all threads in the system. Um, P-thread scheduling allows specifying either PCS or SCS during creation. Um, P-thread scope process uh, threads using uh, PCS scheduling and um, uh, P-thread scope system schedules threads using SCS scheduling. It can be limited by the OS. 
Linux and Mac only allow pthread scope system. So here's an example of using that API. Um, we would get the default attributes and uh, inquire it in the current scope. If we can't get it, we throw an error. If the scope equals the pthread scope, we tell it which type it is. And we set the scheduling algorithm appropriately. We create our threads and now join on them to get them running. And each control will begin will begin controlling this function and then exit. Multiprocessor scheduling is more complex uh, because multiple CPUs are involved or cores. Um, ideally, homogeneous processors are used. There is asymmetric multiprocessing when only one processor accesses the system data structures, alleviating the need for doing sharing. Symmetric pulsar processing, each processor is self-scheduled, all processes in common ready queue, or each has its own private queue of ready processes, um, which is the most common type use, symmetric. Processor affinity, the processor has affinity for processor on which it's currently running. There's soft affinity and hard affinity. And variations include processor sets, where you can have affinity to a set of processors. There's NUMA and CPU scheduling. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, the CPU is, first access is the fast access memory. Uh, and if it needs to call across, it accesses the slower memory and so forth. So for load balancing, if symmetric multiprocess is using, we need to keep all CPUs loaded for efficiency. Load balancing attempts to keep workloads distributed. Uh, push migration is when periodic tasks check load on each processor and if found pushes tasks from an overloaded one to a less overloaded one. Now, the pull migration is when idle processes pull waiting tasks from a busy processor. Um, recently we've done most gone to more uh, multiprocessor cores on a same physical chip. They're faster and more powerful efficient and also more multiple cores threads per core is also growing it takes advantage of a memory stall to make progress on another thread while the memory tree happens very complex stuff so here we have a compute cycle and a memory stall cycle and thread one can interleave itself with thread two so that we're not wasting time while waiting for the memory to unstall Real-time CPU scheduling is a whole other game for real-time processing. Uh, there are obvious challenges. Soft real-time systems is no guarantee as to when critical real-time process will be scheduled. Hard real-time systems have tasks that must be serviced by a deadline. The two types of latencies accept, uh, affect performance. Interrupt latency, time from the arrival of the interrupt to start of routine that services it, and dispatch latency, time for the schedule to take concurrent process off the CPU and switch to another. Um, in a real-time CPU scheduling uh, system, uh, the, the conflict phase of dispatch latency, preemption of any process running in kernel mode, and release by low priority process of resources needed by high priority processes. Basically, the low priority processes get screwed almost all the time. For real-time scheduling, the schedule must perform preemptive priority-based scheduling, but only a guarantees real, uh, soft real-time. For hard real-time, there must also be the ability to meet deadlines. Um, processes will not have new characteristics. Periodic ones require the CPU at constant intervals. It has a process time T, deadline D, and a period P. So the rate of periodic tasks works as follows. For each period, we can only get so much work done, and we have to finish it all in a given time. So now, there's the concept of virtualization. Virtualization software schedules multiple guests onto the CPU. Each guest is doing its own scheduling. So a virtual machine has its own scheduler for its operating system, and the set of virtual machines as a whole have their own schedule. Um, it doesn't know it doesn't own the CPU, so you can get some poor response time, and it can mess up 
time of day clocks in the guests. Um, it can also mess up a uh, good scheduling algorithm. Rate monotonic scheduling is a priority is assigned based on the inverse of its period. Shorter periods equals higher priority, longer periods equals lower priority. P1 is assigned a higher priority than P2, for example. Uh, for real time, you can have earliest deadline first scheduling. Priorities are assigned according to deadlines. The earlier the deadline, the higher the priority, and vice versa. There's also proportional share scheduling. T shares are allocated amongst all processes in the system. An application receives N shares where N is less than T. This ensures each application will receive N over T of the total processor time. POSIX, so POSIX supports real-time uh, scheduling. The API provides functions for ramp managing real-time threads. It defines two scheduling classes, Schedule FIFO and Schedule Round Robin. Um, the differences are that um, there's no time slicing for threads of equal priority. Round Robin introduces that. And there's two functions for getting and setting schedule policy. It's get schedule policy and set schedule policy. So here's an example of using it. We're going to get our current scheduling policy and print it out. Then we're going to set the spot policy um, as appropriate and create the threads and join them and now run them. So now we're going to discuss some examples of various scheduling in different operating systems. For Linux, prior to kernel version 2.5, it ran a, val a variant of the standard Unix scheduling algorithm. 2.5 moved to a constant order scheduling time, meaning the scheduling algorithm is, is much faster. Uh, it's preemptive and priority based. It has two priority ranges, time sharing and real time. Real times range from 0 to 99, and, uh, and the other ones are uh, regular ones are from 100 to 140. I don't know the way the word nice is in there. We map info, map into global priority with numerically lower values, indicating a higher priority. A higher priority will get a larger quantum. The task is runnable as long as there's time left in the time slice. If no time is left, it's not runnable until all other tasks use their slices. All runnable tasks are tracked in the per CPU run queue data structure. It has two priority arrays, active and expired. The tasks are indexed by priority. When no more are active, arrays are exchanged. It works well, but poor times can be achieved for interactive processes. Um, Linux uh, uh, moved on to something called completely fair schedule. Each, cl each class, it comes up with scheduling classes. Each class has a specific priority. The scheduler picks the highest priority task in highest priority scheduling class. So it's rather than quantum based on fixed time, it's based on proportion of the CPU time. Two schedule classes included and others can be added are defa default in real time. Uh, quantum calculation calculated based on nice values meaning uh, the, the appropriate range from negative 20 to 19. Lower values, a higher priority. We, um, we calculate target latency, interval of time during which the task should run at least once. Target latency can increase if the number of activity tasks increase. Um, completely fair schedule maintains per task virtual runtime in a variable called v runtime. It's associated with a decay factor based on the priority of the task. To decide the next task to run, the scheduler picks up tasks with the lowest virtual time. Um, it's a pretty efficient algorithm. Um, and here's some more details you can review in the book. And uh, Linux also supports POSIX real time. Windows uses priority based preemptive scheduling. The highest priority thread always runs next. The dispatcher is part of the scheduler. Uh, the thread runs until it blocks, uses its time slice, or is preempted by a higher priority thread. Real-time threads can preempt non-real-time threads. There's, 30, there's a 32-level priority scheme, scheme. The variable class is 1 through 15, and real-time is 16 through 31. Pre um, 
Priority zero is reserved for mem memory management threats. There's a queue for each priority, and if no runnable thread, it runs an idle thread. Uh, the API identifies several priority classes to which a process can belong. We've got real-time priority, high priority, above normal, normal, below normal, and idle. Uh, all of them are, val are variable except for real-time. A thread with a given priority class has a relative priority, um, which is time critical, highest, above normal, normal, etc. Priority classes and relative priority combine to give a numeric priority. The base priority is normal within the class. If the quantum expires, the priority is lowered but never below the base. If a wait occurs, pri the priority is boosted depending on what was waited for. Uh, foreground windows get a three times uh, boost so we can keep things responsive. Windows 7 added user mode scheduling. The applications create and manage threads independently of the kernel. For large number of threads, it's much more efficient. UMS scheduling comes from programming language libraries like uh, C++ concurrent runtime or the .NET framework. And here are the various different types of priorities. Solaris is priority Solaris is priority based scheduling. There are six classes available: time sharing, interactive, real time, system, etc. We're not going to go too much into detail here because Solaris basically isn't used. Uh, the given thread can be in one of these classes at a time. Each class has its own algorithm, and time sharing is a multi level feedback schedule. So we're going to pop past this. So how do we determine which algorithm to use? Uh, we determine a criteria, then we evaluate our algorithms. Um, we can do deterministic modeling, which is a type of analytic evaluation. It takes a particular predetermined workload and defines the performance of each algorithm. So prior processes arriving at time zero. For each algorithm, we calculate the minimum average waiting time. Um, it's simple and fast, but requires exact numbers of input applied only to those um, Input. So from there, we we'll move on to queuing models. This describes the arrival of processes in CPU and I/O bursts probabilistically. They're commonly exponential and described by by mean by various means. The computer averages throughout utilization, waiting time, etc. The computer system described as a network of servers with each with queue of waiting processes. We know the arrival rates and service rates and we compute utilization, average queue length, and average wait time. So there is a formula called Little's formula, which takes into account the average queue length, the average waiting time, the average arrival rate, and Little's law is in the steady state, processes leaving queue must equal processes arriving. Therefore, Little's law is valid for any scheduling algorithm and arrival distribution. For example, if on average seven processes arrive per second and normally 14 processes are in queue, then the average wait time per process will be two seconds. We can also run simulations. Um, they tend to be more accurate. And they can be a programmed model of the computer system where the clock is set to variable. We gather statistics and use the data driven to get to ride, drive the simulation via random number generators, distribution defined mathematically, or trace tapes record sequences of real events in real systems. So uh, evaluation by simulation is the, if this we had this actual process executing with these times, it would say it would give us uh, first come first serve as probably our uh, performance statistics. And additionally, give us for each one, we'd, we'd run these things and then uh, make our decision. However, even simulations have limited accuracy. Just implement a new scheduler and test it in the real systems. That's high cost and high risk, and the environments can vary. Don't do that. The most, schedule, most flexible schedulers can be modified per site or per system or use APIs to modify priorities, but again, environments vary. So basically what this says is, in a whole, is that scheduling is a very difficult problem, but 
if you use uh, first come first serve or round robin you can achieve decent results without making yourself crazy so unless you have very specific needs